I'm already blessed simply because I'm, I'm home. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Put your hands together. If you're blessed and the Lord doesn't have to do anything, if he never did another thing, you'd still praise him. If he never did another thing, you'd still call him blessed. You'd still glorify his name. If he never did another thing, his credibility would still be good with you. Come on, say amen, somebody. He's a good God. He's a good God, is he not? He's a good God. The hour I know is far spent. If you have allowed, my, my, my little clock here says it's, it's 12.20. Is your clock saying something similar to that? All right, that means we got to get out of here by 1 o'clock. Uh, is that right? All right. It's Sabbath all day, though. It's Sabbath all day. Sabbath all day. It's Sabbath all day. But I will be obedient. I will be obedient to my president and, and, and try to tailor what I have to say. I'm going to jaywalk through this message. But if you've allowed your Bibles to come to church, if they, Bibles like to be in church if you, and at home and everywhere. If you've got a Bible and you've allowed it to come, open it with me, whether it be digital or analog. Open it to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. What book? 1 Kings, what chapter? 18, 18. I want to begin reading at verse 28. 1 Kings 18 and verse 28. The Bible says this, So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. <laughs> and when midday was past, verse 29, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Verse 32, then, the, then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, Fill your water pots with water. Pour it on the burnt offering and sacrifice. Then he said, Do it a second time. And then do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Verse 35, So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled a trench with water. Verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Our theme has been his purpose, my pursuit. Today I want to speak to you from the subject, back to the altar. Back to the altar. Let's pray. Father God, we would see Jesus today. We want to hear from you. So God, hide me in the shadow of your cross that I may not be seen, but that you alone may be seen, honored, glorified, elevated, exalted. If there be any virtue or any praise, take it, for it will only belong to you. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If the Bible were to be compared to something, a roller coaster would be a, best, a very good thing to compare the Bible to. Its stories capture the highs and lows of humanity's first few millennia on earth. There is the high of creation and the low of the fall. There is the high of a people birthed in the loins of a patriarch whom God called to help him save the world, Genesis 12, Genesis 17. But then there is the low of lost purpose and lost commitment of sin and national apostasy, such as we find in 1 Kings chapter 18. In this bit of scripture, we experience the dizzying heights of God's power and the guttural lows of humanity's degradation. Here we see the mountaintop of God's forbearance and the valley of man's disobedience. We see the zenith of true worship and we see the nadir of false worship. The victory of the true God and the defeat of false gods. The atmosphere is tense. It is charged. An eerie silence has engulfed Mount Carmel. In previous times, this elevated mount was lush and green and beautiful, but something has changed now. 
There is pain in the air. Three and a half year drought has settled in. Ellen White describes it this way. The earth is parched as if with fire. The scorching heat of the sun destroys what little vegetation has survived. Streams dry up and lowing herds beat their themselves. Bleeding flocks wander about thither in distress. Once flourishing fields have become like burning desert sands, a desolate wasteland. The groves dedicated to idol worship are leafless now. The forest trees, gaunt skeletons of nature afford no shade. The air is dry now, suffocating now. Dust storms blind the eyes and non-stop breaths are tinged with dirt. Once prosperous cities and villages have become places of mourning, hunger and thirst are telling upon man and beast with fearful mortality. Famine with all its horror comes closer and closer. Prophets and Kings, page 124, 125. The drought outside is a mirror of the drought inside. Perhaps even greater than the physical drought gripping the nation was the spiritual drought that left God's people thirsty and spiritually dehydrated, though they had seemed not to know it. Israel was ruled by the evil King Ahab and King Jezebel. Abraham, ah, uh, Ahab had chosen perhaps the worst choice in a wife ever in the history of Scripture. Ahab's Sidonian bride had held, helped to change the allegiance of God's man to her gods. To appease her, this choice of a mate, Ellen White says, the choice of a mate is one of two decisions that could put you in hell. She says, whether you choose to accept Jesus Christ or not can determine your eternal destiny and whom you choose as a mate can determine your you ought to choose wisely what what started out as small acts of religious compromise became full-blown apostasy in first kings 18 ahab had gone so far as to build jezebel a temple to baal in the capital city of samaria in god's city also erecting an asherah pole complete with four Hundred prophets serving Baal and 450 serving Asherah. 850 prophets to appease a crazy woman. Jezebel's first recorded act in scripture is prophet genocide. 3 ABN family, all of us listening today, false worship and false worshipers will always seek the death of true worship and true worshipers. False worship and true worship cannot coexist. False worship always tries to kill true worship. 1 Kings 18 and verse 4, the Bible says that when Jezebel massacred the prophets of, of the Lord, Obadiah, a God-fearing officer of Ahab's court who had feared the Lord, hid a hundred of them in a cave and seek... I'm just so glad that God always has somebody. It's never everybody. It's always somebody who's going to stand up for righteousness though the heavens fall. The Bible says in 1 Kings 16 and verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Can you imagine that? Elder Clark did more to provoke, provoke the anger of the Lord than all the presidents of the Guyana Conference before him. What, what an amazing epitaph to write next to your name. What if God called you out and said, put this by his name. He made me more mad than everybody else. That's Ahab. Is it into this devastating spiritual crisis and morass that God calls a prophet whose name is Jehovah is my God? It's almost as if God saw this moment in history and dreamed up Elijah to meet it. God gave him his name and when he was born and set him aside to be a prophet. Then God brought him to the forefront to confront Ahab and Jezebel at just the right time. God will bring the people when he's ready. Satan might have his couple in the suites, but God has got his people in the streets. You may not know it right now, but your gifts and your talents, your unique abilities and your capabilities and your capacities are ordained by God for higher purpose. You are here to do something for God. Never doubt that God has something for you to do. Elijah, Ellen White says, there dwelt in the days of Ahab a man of faith and prayer whose fearless ministry was destined to check the rapid spread of apostasy. Tell somebody next to you, God won't let it go on forever. When Elijah confronted Ahab, he accused God's prophet of trouble. Oh, are you the one who troubles Israel? Perhaps that was understandable, for it was Elijah who had declared in no uncertain terms that not a drop of rain would fall. 
Can you imagine that? You march in, country preacher comes from the country, smells like the country. He came from Burmese, come from the country all the way down to Georgetown, walks into the church in the middle of the service and tells everybody, it will never rain again until I say so. And then walks right out. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You got to have major league power with you to walk up in the king's palace and tell him, go king. God said it's not going to rain. Not until my word. Perhaps it was understandable then that he got upset. Three years later, Ahab's resolve now was broken. When Elijah ordered Ahab to meet him on Mount Carmel, beloved, the power of God was resting so powerfully on his servant. And, and the famine had so broken the nation that Ahab said, yes. All of his pomp is gone now. All of his idolatry, Elder Bowman, is gone now. Everything that he had built up is gone now. God had softened up the nation for three years with a famine. And rest assured, beloved, you keep going down your road. God will soften you up. <laughs> He'll send a famine for things you don't know yet that you can't live without. He will send a famine in your spiritual experience so that you recognize him as God of the universe. Tell somebody next to you, I don't want no famine in my life. I don't want a famine, beloved, not in my life. Meet me on Mount Carmel, said the prophet of God. Bring all eight, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Let's see whose God is the real God. Showdown on Mount Carmel. When everyone had assembled, Elijah said, bring two bulls. I will slay and prepare one of them, and you all do the same. I will lay my pieces on the altar, and you lay your pieces on the altar. Verse 24 says, then you call on the name of your God, small g, and I will call on the name of my God. And the God who answers by fire, he's God. Lord, have mercy. I'm talking about hijack. You can't ask nobody to do something like this unless you know God. I hope I'm talking to somebody today. I, I, we we, we want to pursue the purposes of God, but do you pursue God? Uh, we want to do the, the things of God, but do you know God? That God can answer to your call. You know the story. The prophets of Baal called to their God from morning until noon and no fire came. Years of false worship and years of sin of ap and apostasy. Years of sound and fury signifying nothing. Years of spiritual mumbo jumbo and, and prosperity preaching. Years of failed prophecy. The flowing robes didn't mean power. The prosperity sermons didn't mean God's approval. The alliances between religious and political elites did not mean anything on Carmel. All that mattered on Carmel was that you knew God or not. The only thing that mattered was whether or not you could get a prayer through. Shout louder, screamed Elijah. Can't you see him? Shout louder. He can't hear you. Maybe your God is asleep. He's jeering them now. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. Elijah is cruel to these people. Beloved, don't follow Elijah on this right here. Don't be, don't be nasty with it. You know. Elijah tells them maybe he's asleep. Cry louder. As they begin now to slash themselves and cut themselves with swords and spears and lances, the blood begins to flow down their bodies. It is a ghastly, devastating, evil, nasty scene. There is no response. No God answers. Baal has no fire power. But then the Bible says in verse 30, Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. Come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord. He took 12 stones, each representing 12 new stones, not old stones, 12 new stones, each representing one of the tribes of the people and, uh, that had descended from Jacob, Israel. With them, he built an altar, then dug a trench around it, filled four large jars with water and doused the sacrifice. You know the story well. I'm, that's not where I'm going. With the parched tongues hanging out and of the evening breeze, thirsty lips aghast at this waste of water. People have no water to drink, and he's dousing the sacrifice with water that people need to drink. The water ran down the altar and filled the trench. Verse 36 says, and it came to pass at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah prayed to God. <laughs> 
Hey, all day long, they shouting and screaming, but I came to tell you, when God's ear is tuned to his servants, it matters not when they pray, that God hears them when they pray. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned. Is there anybody in here that knows how to call on God, that knows how to talk to him, that knows how to say, Lord, hear me? And God hears and answers prayer. Verse 38, then the fire. Can you imagine that scene? Parched, messed up. The people have been out there all day. But when Elijah. Testing. Ah. Praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Yeah, he's going to try to shut me down today. I'm Check still going, one. I'm still going to yell. This is the backup. This is the backup. We keep this one for the backup. Is that all right? Uh -oh. How are we doing? Can you all hear me all right? The Bible says, then the Lord. <laughs> now, now, when all the people saw that the fire came down and licked up all the water and, and, and cleaned up the trench. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their knees, fell on their faces, the Bible says. And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Praise the Lord for that. Sometimes God has got to show. All right, how we doing? All right, let's see if we can preach the sound out of this one too. The demonstration of God's power that day, beloved, was unmistakable. It was unparalleled. It was unprecedented. It was unforgettable. In an instant, God had rebalanced the scales, restored his honor, reclaimed his street credibility, and reordered the priorities of the nation. In a single moment, God had changed everything in his nation. Had God ever restored something in your life in an instant, beloved? I'm talking about something that was broken for a long time. Something that might have been messed up in your family or your children. And in a moment, God changes things. I remember when one of my older brothers was ascending the slopes of Fool's Hill. Any parents know about children that end up on Fool's Hill? Don't know how to get back down? acting crazy. He was running with some girl. My parents didn't have a, my, my, my mother was concerned about him and the fact that this girl was messing with his life and he was messing her life up. I, I went by my brother's room one day and my mother was on her knees by his bed and she had the word by his bed and I heard her praying over him and then I asked the lady, Mom, what were you praying? She said, I was playing Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I said, but <laughs> I ain't lying to y'all. She said, I'm praying that the Lord will put enmity between him and that girl. I said, well, I've never heard the gospel message preached that way, prayed that way ever before. I never heard that text used in that context, mama, but I think the Lord will still answer. Not only did God answer one day that Joker walked in, he came in the house, he fell down at my mother's knees, grabbed her around her ankles and cried and cried and cried and cried. Begged her forgiveness. God can change things in an instant when the fire comes down. You could pray the fire down. I dare you to pray his word. You will pray the fire down. Elijah said, you could tell me all you want to tell me. At the end of this day, you will have one thing that you could say, Israel. The Lord, he is God. We can't help but shout at God's fiery triumph. I love this scripture. I like the Mount Carmel shout. I'm excited when I look at Mount Carmel. I, 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 I'm just excited at what God did when the fire came down. But could we be missing something in this scripture? God is the one who breathed into humanity's nostrils the breath of life when man became a living soul. Elijah could have asked God to simply withhold his breath from the prophets of Baal. That would have been enough. Elijah could have asked God to, to withhold their breath. They could have fallen lifeless to the ground. The prophet could have said, Lord, I know you bad. Why don't you just make me levitate off the ground? That would be proof that you're God. 
But I have a feeling that, that if the Lord had taken their breath away, people would serve God out of fear because every breath would be a fearful enterprise. Elijah could have asked God to levitate him off the ground, but surely if the people saw him suddenly rise up unaided into the sky, they would say it was a miracle, but it was not something that God did. Something else did it. Elijah could have asked God to demonstrate his power that day in multiple ways, but he chose something specific. He said, God, that altar that's broken, that altar that's messed up, that altar that they no longer worship at, I am going to rebuild that, and I want you to put fire from heaven down on that altar and consume the sacrifice. I'm going somewhere. This isn't the false first altar mentioned in Scripture. There's an altar uh, 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 in, in, intimation in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that God comes down and covers them. There's an altar right there in Genesis sacrificing to God. Sin always causes the death of something. And God has to rebuild it. When God delivered Israel from Egyptian captivity, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary, an altar, that I may dwell among them. There are 400 references to altars in the Bible. The word altar is first used in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, when Noah builds an altar to the Lord after leaving the ark. In scripture, altars always represent a place of consecration, a place of dedication, a place of devotion to God. Altars in scripture were often built to commemorate encounters with God. When God told Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 7 that I will give you the land of Canaan for your descendants, Abram built an altar because his encounter there with God was super normal. When Isaac was wandering the desert of Gerar, fighting the locals over water, the Lord told him, I will be with you. I will bless you and multiply your seed. He built an altar there because his interaction with God was supernatural. Jacob, in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 3, went to Bethel and built an altar there. After God told him to build one to commemorate the time when he appeared to him, he, uh, Jacob's encounter with God was super special. So he built an altar. Gideon, fearful, wondering whether he was up to the challenge, built an altar because God told him, I will give you victory. Jehovah is my peace. When God is super peaceful, you ought to build an altar. David built one in first. Chronicles 21 and verse 26. After God disciplined him for daring to number the people of Israel. God sent a disaster upon Israel and he relented as God commanded. David built an altar at Ornan's threshing floor. Despite his sin, God had forgiven him, had raised him back up in the, part, in the presence of the people. And because God's blessing on his life was super spiritual, he built an altar. When God moves on your job, you should build an altar. When God moves in your family, you should build an altar. When God moves in your house and in your car, when you somehow come home and other people don't, you ought to build an altar. God moves in our lives. There ought to be altars on highways and back roads and all over Burbese. Wherever we come from, in Linden and Sue's Dyke, wherever we come from, altars ought to be there. Because of the goodness of God. Altars represent a person's desire to consecrate themselves to God. That's why it's a telling fact that when Elijah calls the people to Mount Carmel, the first thing, I said the first thing, the first thing he does is to rebuild the altar. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but altars are being broken in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We got a problem in this church. Some studies tell us very recently that only 37% of Adventist families have any kind of worship altar. Personal devotional life, only 52% of Seventh-day Adventists have any kind of devotional life. Now, my question to you is this. How does a church... With a message centered on worship, deliver a worship-centered message if it doesn't worship. I, I want to know how that's possible. How, is it, how are you going to deliver the three angels' messages of Revelation 14? One, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Angel 1, worship him first. 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her persecution. You, you know it, you know it. Uh, worship is at the center of the end time biblical message this church has to give. And the people trying to give it don't worship. I'm trying to get with you today. I didn't, uh, uh, the, you know, I started, I was sitting there and, and flipped to another sermon. And the Lord said, flip back. Do not change this message. I'm here to tell you today, it's a telling fact that the first thing he does is he builds the altar. The first thing the prophet does was to rebuild the altar of God. But how did the altar get torn down? You ought to ask yourself that question. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 8. Aaron didn't, Aaron said, you know, the people told me, Moses, that they wanted a calf. They wanted, because you were up there with God, and when you didn't come down, I built a calf. And you see, beloved, if, if you want to mess up the worship altar, just add things to it. Yeah, yeah, just, just, just add some stuff. Just come up with your own stuff and just add it into the worship experience with God. Uh, all the way down through time now, Jeroboam didn't prohibit worship. Notice now, Jeroboam now is going to build on what has been done before. Jeroboam didn't prohibit worship at the time of Jerusalem. He just added a calf in Dan and Beersheba. That's all he did. He just added to the worship. He was a weak leader, a narcissistic complex. If the people of the northern kingdom of Israel went to worship at the Lord's temple in the southern kingdom of Judah, their hearts would leave him as the leader of the nation. So he said, listen, I'll make it more convenient for you to worship. I'll put all kind of devices in your hand so you can worship. I'm not against devices, but I know that when I have this device on and I'm trying to worship, all kinds of other things come into my experience. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Some studies tell us that, 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 that people touch this device 2,400 times a day. Touching this more than they're touching their wives. And they're me. I'm here to tell you, beloved, everything that technology brings us is not the best for us. We, we, we live lives, one author says, we live lives mediated by screens when God created us for face-to-face -face communication. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I'm here to tell you, you better get your altar back. You better get that place where God meets with you and don't let anything mess with you. Well, it's 1247, so let me... Hurry on right now. I could tell you that this thing right here is probably one of the greatest threats to worship in the history of the world. Studies tell us we spend an average of two hours and 47 minutes on social media every single day on this device. I'm not talking about the people from Burmese. I'm talking about the people from America. Not, not, not the people in here. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me and other people. Two hours and 47 minutes uh, and, and, and if you're from the Philippines, it's three hours and 50 minutes. Ah, but spending time with God is so, it's so hard. Bible says, or well, Spirit of Prophecy says that by beholding, we become changed. Changed. One author says the tech, we make the technology, we make the technology in, 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 for, for one reason, but then it remakes us in its image. Remakes us. I'm talking about your worship altar and why it's so critical today, beloved. The first point I want to make is this. Uh, well, let, let me give you this one quote. Let me give you this one quote. Uh, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, Selwyn White, page 331, 1888. She wrote this. It is a law of both the intellectual and spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. And listen to this. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects on which it is allowed to dwell. So whatever you are putting in your head changes your circuitry of your brain. And after a while, people like me will stand up here and have to do somersaults to get your attention because you have been plied and you have been spending time and you have been entertained to your spiritual death. Back to the altar is what the prophet said. Let's go back where God is is what the prophet said. The first thing I want you to know, beloved, is this. This is, this is point number one. I'm going to go real fast. Point number one. I've got two points. Point number one. If you rebuild it, God will come to it. That's the first point. If you rebuild it, God will come to it. 
It was after Elijah had rebuilt the altar and doused it with water, the Holy Spirit represented him, that then lifted his heart to God in prayer, that the fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Notice Elijah's prayer. Notice Elijah's prayer. He wanted God to be proven God. He didn't say, Lord, send the fire down so that they will know that I'm your man. He said, no, God, when the fires come down, they will know that you are God. They will know that I am your servant. And they will confess that you are God. Oh, precious family from Belize, when you rebuild that altar in your house and that altar on your job, when you rebuild your altar, people will know that you have been with God. The fire will be all over you. And when they see the fire, don't tell them, well, you know, it's because I went to school and studied. Oh, I pray that you give them credit. Don't tell them, you know, well, I'm a vegetarian, so, you know, that that's, that's explains my nice skin. I came to tell you, no matter how good our accomplishments, beloved, we are nothing without the goodness of God. Come on, talk to me. If it were not for grace, songwriter says, I can't tell you where I'd be. Build the altar. He rebuilt the altar first. I am your servant, God. I want you to be glorified in the morning. It was in the morning the Christian's first thoughts should be of God. This is, this is Auntie Ellen talking. <laughs> Signs of the Times, 1886. Come before him with humility, with a heart full of tenderness, and with a sense of temptations, of the temptations and dangers that will surround you and your children, morning and evening by earnest prayer, and, ki and kindly and untiringly teach them how to live so that they may please God. I dare you, beloved of God in Verbeese, to set the morning and evening sacrifice to God. I dare you to turn off your phone and turn on your God. I dare you to give more time to your God than you do to your media. Rebuild the altar in your, in your personal life and your pursuit of God's purpose will take wings. There will be fires from the throne of God that will attend you. Not only must you build it, beloved, if you build it, he will come. But point number two, if you build it, it will build you. I said, I'm going to say it one more time. If you build it, it will build you. What you build, builds you. I want to tell you, beloved, I, 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 don't, do I, do I have the time, the time, the time. I got eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes. I got eight minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be obedient to Elder Clark, Elder Clark said. Elder, if Elder Clark, I don't care what y'all say. If Elder Clark don't say it, I'm not doing it. All right. Thank you, Elder Clark. Thank you. Okay, we, we good, we good. I, but I'm still going to try so, beloved, I'm talking about what you build builds you. And if you build it, Jehovah will come to it. So, I had a, I had a, a man in my church, uh, one of the members called. They said, uh, uh, Pastor, I don't know if you've noticed, but, but one of our members has been missing. He, he, he's in bad shape. He needs a knee replacement. He can't walk. I said, well, you know, I hadn't seen him for a while. And I said, he needs a knee replacement. She said, but this is the thing. He is an undocumented person in the United States. That is, he doesn't have papers to be in the United States. So he can't go into the, the, the health care system and get help. He's in the shadows, and now his leg has broken down. People have been taking advantage of him for years because they know he can't go to the authorities. If he goes, he gets deported. And, and, and let me tell you, America's an interesting place. I, I, when they told me that something from the Lord said, help him. Help him. I called my son, Elder Clark. I called him down to the basement of our house. I said, son, I, I want you to behold a miracle of the Lord. I said, God is going to do something amazing. I told him the story. I said, I want you to be a witness to the fire falling. I didn't know what I was going to do. We prayed, and then I started calling people. I said, I need some people to pledge some money. The, 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 one, I, I, I reached out to one doctor. He put me in that touch with another doctor. This doctor said, I will do it. It'll be about $15,000. I'll do it. Took him, got him, got up early in the morning, took him over to that doctor. The doctor checked him out. The doctor said, this thing is so messed up. He needs a specialist doing it. You're going to have to take him somewhere else. Got there another day. Took him all the way down to one of our university hospitals, big time university hospital in, 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 in Washington, D.C. Took him in. The doctor examined him. And the doctor said, yeah, this is, this is bad, but, but, but this is what I do. 
Doc said, this is what I do. That's, that's not a problem. I kept asking the doctor, doctor, how much, how much, how much, how much? He said, oh, don't worry about that, son. No, don't worry. Don't worry about how much. He just kept examining him. Found out later the surgery was going to be $150,000. I said, Lord, you have a problem. I, I don't have a problem. You have a, you have a big problem, Lord. Uh, this, this, this is your thing. You got to do this thing. The day came for the surgery. I told him, make the appointment for the surgery. We have no money. I said, make the appointment. He said, Pastor, I don't know, man. We, 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 can't, we can't go up in this thing. We don't have, I don't have no, no card, no insurance card, nothing. I said, make the appointment. Picked him up that morning when I got to his house. He said, Pastor, I can't get in your car. This, this, we, we don't know what's going to happen over there. I said, I know what's going to happen. We're going. We are not stopping ourselves. The devil going to have to stop us, but we're not stopping ourselves. Do I have anybody in this house who knows sometimes you got to put your hands on your hips and just say, I'm going anyway in the name of Jesus. I don't care what happens. God's going to have to stop me. I'm not stopping myself. Put him in my car and started driving. We got to that place, parked that car, took him into the hospital. When I got in, one of the nurses right there that welcomed us in said, you know, you have come to the right place. I knew right then the spirit of the Lord was in this place. That nurse said, you have come to the right place. She said, this doctor has, you see the people working around here? He has fixed all of us. I said, well, Lord Jesus, I'm in the right place. Thank you, Father. Walked up to the counter. The woman said, the woman at the counter said, uh, do you have your insurance card? I looked at her. I said, man, we don't have it. She said, ah, don't worry. We'll, we, we, we'll get it later. I said, well, Amen. Don't worry about it. We will get it later. She said, have a seat. We went and sat down. I was sitting there thinking, Lord, don't let this woman come and ask for this card because we in trouble today. We don't have no card. We don't have no insurance. We have no business being here. We can't pay for a single thing. We are here with a smile on our face in Jesus' name. And Jesus going to pay the bill. I ain't got nobody to pay this bill. All the folk from Davis Memorial right now are saying, this is how you break hospitals. You know, these people that come in here talking about the Lord and don't want to pay no bill. The Davis Memorial people got a problem with what I'm with this testimony right now. Close your ears, Bill. Close your ears, Davis. It's okay. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. The Jesus pays the bills. It's okay. Help the people anyway. Saints of the living God, let me tell you something. They came. They came. They scheduled him. I looked up on the board where they scheduled the surgeries and saw his name scheduled. And then they wheeled, came in with the stretcher and put him on it and wheeled him to the back. All the time I'm praying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm sitting, I'm sitting there looking, trying to look like I belong. You get that look on your face like, yes, I have a card. I do have a card. No card. Beloved, he had the surgery, came out. I met him in the hallway. That was two years ago. There has not been a single bill that has come to his home. Saints, I came to tell you what you build will build you. It wasn't at that moment that I started learning how to pray. I prayed before that. It wasn't at that moment that I came to understand what God could do. I knew him before that. I had seen him do things in my life and with my mother and with my family. I had seen him do things. Yesterday, a young man visited me at the hospital, uh, at, at the hotel where I was, uh, a young man that grew up with, with my family, and he said, I want you to tell your mother how much we love her for what she did for my family. I said, I want to record you. He said, record me so you tell her what I said. My mother used to send barrel after barrel for his family and take care of that family down here. Never forgot them and they never forgot her. I know what God can do. You can't tell me nothing about what God can do. When you build your altar, it builds you. And the promise of God is that if you take time with me and if you come to me, that when you pursue my purpose, you will have my power. When you pursue my purpose, you'll have my providence. When you pursue my purpose, you'll have my presence. But you have got to bow your knees and make time for me. Oh, Berbice, I came to tell you today, get back to your altar. 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 
everything that the president talked about doing, everything that the leaders up here talked about doing, everything that we need to do, the prerequisite is that you have been with God. Every one of them. When you walk in, people must know you come in the presence and power of God. There ought to be something on you. You ought to be able to have to hide your face like, 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 like Moses used to have to do from his time with God. He used to come out and they'd have to hide his face. In fact, Joshua used to watch the power that rested upon him. And the Bible says Joshua would go stand by the tent and, and try to get some of what Moses got. He wanted his own shine, his own power. This is something that lived in the life of Jesus. Jesus was a person who personified this power with God. Bible says in the book of Luke that after he had healed a man, he ran away from the people so he could go pray. Watch him in Mark chapter 1. The Bible says they come out to him and they tell him when they finally find him, he healed, you know, people all day long. And then the Bible says that night he went and spent all night in prayer after he was tired. Tiredness is not a reason not to pray. <laughs> Lack of food is not a reason not to pray. That's not a reason to move your spiritual experience because your body is talking to you. Jesus said, I have been out here giving out so much that I'm empty. I'm not sleeping until I talk to my father. Spent all night in prayer. Mark chapter 1, they come to him. They, come, they finally find him. And the disciples say to him, Lord, all men seek thee. Everybody has come out now. The whole town is looking for you. Everybody wants what you did yesterday. And the Bible says, Jesus says to them, let's go to another city. Let's go to Capernaum, for I must go preach the gospel there now. What he's saying in that moment is something very powerful. My father told me last night, don't stay here. How many of us? In the, in the face of a crowd of people waiting for miracles that we can do, can walk away from that because the Lord said go somewhere else. When they're shouting your name and they're saying how great you are and they're telling you how special you are and you leave them there because you're on a mission from God, the only way Jesus could make that decision between two very good uh, possibilities was that he had been with his father. There's something we miss when we miss the altar of God. We miss the power of God. We miss the presence of God. We miss the protection of God. So I want to say to you, you ought to come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. The song says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Anybody want the altar of God to be rebuilt? I'm going to challenge you today. We ain't got a whole lot of space, but I don't believe in ending sermons without an appeal. I'm going to call you today. If, if, if you know that the altar of your personal life is not where it used to be, the altar of your personal life is not where it used to be, I want you to simply stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you know... God, I want my altar to be built in the presence of God. Maybe there's somebody here who wants to say, Lord, for my family, for my family, I need my altar back. For my family, I need my altar back. If that's you, press to the front. Press to the front. Come on down there saying, Lord, for my family, for my family, press to the front. Press, 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 press. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time, but maybe you want to say, God, my, my altar, my altar, my altar, in my home, in my life, I want to make sure, God, that I'm moving from a place of power, from a place of anointing, from a place where I've been with God. If that's you, just move, just move, just move. God sees you, God sees you, God sees you. Press to the front. Come on a little closer. Come on up a little farther. Make some room, make some room. Pastor Clark, come, 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 Pastor Clark, come, Pastor Clark. God is speaking in this moment. I believe God is saying to us in no uncertain terms, your altar has got to be rebuilt. What you rebuild, 
will build you if you rebuild it the promise of God is I'll come to it if you rebuild it I'll come to it if you make a place for me I'll show up I will send fire from heaven upon you and your loved ones and you will walk out and you will be empowered to do my work for me anybody in here wants to do the work of God that he may come praise the Lord Pastor Clark this is your flock these are the people that God has given you. I want you to pray for God's people and that God's Holy Spirit will not just, sh will not just show up, but will, will, will burn up everything that we sacrifice to him for his cause and for his glory. I invite you to reverently bow your heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father, today, We have listened to a revelation from your Holy Spirit. Clearly, God, you have spoken a message that has stirred our hearts, a message that has challenged us to new heights of commitment. A message that has instructed us in the things that we, we need to know and understand and to execute in our lives so that we can experience your power, experience your presence. We can experience your providence. We can experience your provisions your protection. Thank you, God, that in spite of where we have been, in spite of how we have messed up, and even though we may have broken down our altars, by faith today, we have come back to the altar. We have come for strength. We have come for grace. We have come for help. So that we can rebuild strong spiritual altars. Oh God, we don't want to be ritualistic. We don't want to be routinistic. We don't want to live on the ordinary plane. We just don't want to live anyhow for now. We want to be a people of prayer and a people of power. Today we're coming back to the altar, God. We're laying ourselves before you prostrate at the altar take us God take our mortal flesh oh God let your Holy Spirit be poured out afresh on your people today let wisdom be released in our in our in our hearts let divine intelligence be released in our lives let divine competence and capacity be released in our lives so that, oh God, we can serve you from a place of dynamism and power. And, oh God, as we move forward into the future, into the new year, when we show up, the fire will come down. And glory will fill our vessels. And the world will know that we have been with Jesus. Oh God, we thank you for your manservant today, Pastor Esmond. Thank you for bringing him to, the, to, the, to, to these shores, bringing him back home. Thank you for the revelation you have given to him. Thank you for the word from your throne room that's been declared to your people today. Thank you for the conviction it has brought. Thank you for the transformation. I pray, God, that you will anoint your servant continually. Bless your servant, God. Pave a road of prosperity for him and his family as he moves on in service for you. And oh God, I pray that this word today will be like a seed planted that will bring forth a tremendous spiritual harvest for us as a people, for our churches across this constituency, yea, even for our conference and this great nation. Bless your people. We consecrate our hearts today. And we give you thanks for what you've done and for what you will continue to do because we ask these blessings on the merits of Jesus Christ. Let the church say, Amen.
mountains of God. After such a heart stirring message, we want to stand as we sing our closing hymn. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. Be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. Live out thy life within me, and all things have thy way. I, the, the transparent medium, thy glory to display. Hymn 316, 316. And I want to invite the praise team to join me even as we make use of this beautiful hymn. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. Be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. Live out thy life within me, in all things of thy special blessing upon us. What a marvelous God you are to us. We want to say thank you in a special way for choosing us to be your children. We want to thank you dear Lord for calling, out, calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Dear Lord, we know from the bottom of our hearts that when we walk in the light of God, we are reformed. We are changed for the goodness, for the better. We are made noble. We are made kind and hospitable. We are made gentle and loving and kind. Qualities that we all admire in other people. And so, dear God, we thank you, dear God, for the privilege of walking in the light of God. We pray, dear Father, that we will sense the need to reshuffle and to, 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 to replace things in our lives that need to be replaced. Help us, dear Lord, to place high priority on our spirituality. As you have used the preacher to say, Help us, dear Lord, to place high priority in building our altar, our personal altar, our family altar, our church altars, dear Lord. And so, dear God, take full control of us. Bless us and help us, dear Lord, that as we make these moves, I pray, dear Father, that we will find it enjoyable, that we will find it a very pleasant thing. And so minister unto us. Save us by your grace. Save us by your power. And when all is said and done, I pray that all that is here and all that is represented here will 
be in the kingdom of God. We thank you for your blessings today. Continue to minister unto us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless us.